sifting. The process of grading, refining and removing what is not required. Without sifting, we can end up with an imperfect or completely failed result. What we may not realise is God does the same. As we go through life, he selects, he shakes, sometimes allowing suffering or leaving us in what feels like complete silence. It is up to us to recognise this sifting and allow the work of his hand to bring joy through the process. I pray we may learn to recognise, respond and rejoice in what it means to be sifted. everybody. I've used this little prop, this little sieve, this old one of mine. This used to be my, my grandfather's sieve and it sits at my home not doing a lot of work anymore. But both sides of the sieve are useful because you can either, if you're putting, this is generally used for sand, this one, but if I put some soil or sand into the top here, fine stuff or fine earth stuff will come out the bottom and it will keep the rougher stuff in the top. If I want to use the rougher stuff, that's where I go. If I want to keep the finer stuff, that's where I go. And God uses this concept of taking out the things that are rough and big and problematic and uses us. And last week we talked about the idea of being refined, not like silver, but being refined in the furnace of suffering. And so God refines us and refinement is very similar and it's, I could say it's exactly the same as this sifting process. And it's my prayer that this series has been an encouragement to you. I'm sure that there's been things that have, that have been a little bit ouchy and there's probably going to be some more things today that may be if you allow it to be, you can be offended. I don't want you to be. But I do believe that God has put in our, in our life processes, a sifting process that will fine tune us and bring us into his presence. He always has a purpose. And that purpose involves bringing his children into a deeper understanding of himself and his ways. He wants us to know him. And today's message is really no different to that from the other three of this series. Today's message stems from perhaps one of the most asked questions that I as a pastor get asked. And it's not like it's every week or anything, but I'm constantly being asked to pray for somebody or something or some thing that happens in our world. And, I, and one of the things that sometimes, not always, I do ask is, is you can pray for yourself. I oh, know God doesn't answer me or he doesn't listen to me. You've got your, in fact, the, the better line is you're a little bit closer to him than what I am. You're on a different plane. Uh, that's not always true. I'm just as human as any one of you. And I struggle in my prayer times as much as you probably struggle in yours. But I'm conscious that the question that most often asked is, Pastor, why does God seem so silent? Why doesn't he answer my prayers? And I don't even want to pretend to try and answer that completely today because I don't think, for one, we've got enough time to go through all of it. And the secondly, I don't think we can possibly even understand all the reasons full stop because we're human beings. There are going to be things that we will never understand this side of heaven and we don't need to understand this side of heaven. But the scriptures do give us some very clear reasons why God may not answer our prayers, why he may be silent. And it's some of these principles that I want to touch on today. Just three. In fact, there's a bunch of them. If you have your sermon notes, whether they're on a device or they're in a hard copy, whatever you've done with that, on the back there are some study questions. I think it's about question four or three, somewhere around there. There's, there's a whole stack of scriptures that will outline a bunch of other reasons. I want you to go through them if you get the chance. There's, this is just three today. 
And I don't even think the list on the back is going to be an exhaustive list. But there are potentially dozens of reasons why God might be silent. And I don't think or believe that God wants to be silent in relation to us hearing what he has to say. I don't think he wants to be silent in letting us know his will, but I do think that there are some, he is unable to let us hear because of barriers that we have put in place that prevent him from being able to come close to us like he wants to. And being sifted or being drawn into his presence or being allowed to come into that presence of, the, of his spirit may seem like a little bit of a stretch today. It's not what you would call a, a direct sifting, but believe me, I believe that God has sometimes and needs to remain silent in order for us to wake up, to sift out some things that we might otherwise keep on doing, which would not bring us into a deeper relationship with God. So God's silence in answering your prayer may be a way that he has of sifting you or drawing you into his presence a little bit deeper. So if God's not, if you're not hearing God speak to you, because I do believe he is, if God's, if you are, cannot hear him at the moment, then apart from the things that we're going to talk about today, just understand that nothing happens without God's purpose and plan and that he is sovereign and he can do whatever he likes. So don't think that just because he's silent, it means that we can wave some magic wand and have him answer our prayers the way that we want to, because that's not true either. But as I said, the scriptures do outline for us some very crucial, important things that will hinder God from being able to relate with us in the way of answering our prayers. If, you, if you're married, if you have been married or are married, and I'm confident you've all done this, but and you have experienced the silent treatment from your partner, does anyone not experience that? I'm sure we've all done that. If you have married or been in some relationship of some kind and you have experienced the silent treatment from your spouse, you probably know at that moment that you have done something wrong and you need to sort it out. If for some reason, in my case, my wife stops talking to me, usually that's a sign as she's mad at me. I get that. Even as a man, I understand that big hint. And when we're receiving the silent treatment from a spouse, we have two options in that process. We can either dig our heels in because we know we're right and maintain our righteousness in all of that, and or we can humble ourselves and admit our error and restore the relationship. They're the two options that we always have. And that, listen, I want you to understand this because this is also transferable into our relationship with God at points. The, the time that it takes for us to humble ourselves and admit our fault with our spouse is directly proportional to the time it will take to get back to a normal kind of relationship. The longer we hold on and maintain our own self-righteousness, the longer the dysfunctional part of the relationship will, will be there. If we are able to recognise that if we humble ourselves, admit our wrongdoing, seek to restore the relationship, that we will find ourselves back in a relationship very, very quickly. And the longer that time is, goes on, the longer it will take to get back. If you're not married, you're a young person, remember, connection, communication is vital. And we need to humble ourselves that even if you think you're right, we need to recognise that there are two sides to every story and begin to think how others might think. So, 
If you've never come to that humbling humility point, the chances are the relationship, at least the way that you once knew the relationship to be, is gone. And many, many, many marriages have ended because of the unwillingness for us to admit our faults and seek forgiveness. And I think that's a key thing for us, not just in our human marriage concept, but in our relationship with our Heavenly Father as well. If we continue to maintain our self-righteousness, we are right and you are wrong, and we dig our heels in, and we're unwilling to humble ourselves and come before God, admit our wrongdoing, and seek his forgiveness, we will continue to be at a distance in the relationship that God wants to have with us. And he will be unable, not unwilling, but unable to communicate with us the way that he wants to because of our hardness of heart. We need to understand that. 1 John 5 says this, we are confident that he, being God, he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know that he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. That's John speaking. And Jesus himself said much the same thing just before his crucifixion. He had just spoken to his disciples and the impending death of Jesus was right there, but his resurrection as well. And it was clear to Jesus that they, these disciples had so many questions that were not able to be answered in that moment. So look what Jesus says to them in John 16. He says, so you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth, you will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before, he says. Ask using my name, and you will receive, and you will have Abundant joy. Two very distinct, encouraging verses that tell us that if we ask according to his will, that he hears us and he will give us an answer to that. He will give us what we need and ask for, providing we ask for it according to his will and in his name. Jesus says, you haven't done this before to his disciples but if you ask anything in my name, you'll get it. So why would there be times in your life and my life where it seems that all of the prayer in the world seems to fall on deaf ears? Has it, is it that God has his finger in his ears and he's doing this, la, 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 la? You do that. I do that. Our children do that. But God doesn't do that. God's desires is that we communicate with him and his silence at time is a perturbing matter. We, it, it, it disturbs us at times. Why would God be silent? And in our atheistic society that we have, God's silence is often cited as, a, as, a re, as evidence that God doesn't even exist. If God were real, if God were some force in nature, and if God was something that we communicate with, why doesn't he just show himself? And the fact that he's silent is evidence that they give that, he doesn't, that he's not there, or at the very least, that he doesn't care. That God is just sitting up there somewhere in, in the sky laughing at us because he's put everything in place and watching everything unfold and, and, and not interested in really what's taking place. And that's the way our atheistic society views God so regularly because there is no concept that anything else could be right. If God really wanted to reveal himself, 
Couldn't he simply appear to everybody? Couldn't he just simply make himself known? Or at least, couldn't he speak directly to individuals in an unmistakable act of communication if God were really there? And I'll answer that for you. The answer is yes, he can. And yes, he does at times. There are countless numbers of testimonies, personal testimonies, where Jesus, the risen Jesus Christ, has, has been seen, has been in a vision or has spoken to directly to people. He has spoken even where their ears have been deaf and, and lives have been changed across our nation and across our world because people have witnessed a risen Jesus in a vision or, or hear, heard his voice in an unmistakable way. But there are also the problems where even though that happens, that God's words still fall on deaf ears who do not want to hear. Romans tells us that the glory of God is all around us. All around us. Look out the windows. Look outside right at this moment. And the glory of God is right before our eyes. But it's rarely attributed to God. It's even if God spoke through some direct, unmistakable communication, I am absolutely confident that many would still doubt the existence of God. But rather than God's silence being proof of his non existence, I believe that God's silence is because there are some conditions at times, there may be some conditions that cause God to hold back and to remain silent for us. Not so much as a punishment, but as a means of drawing us into his presence, of helping us to become aware of those things. Now, I'm not proposing at all that all God's silence in our prayers is that. It's not, because as I said before, God is sovereign and he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants and however he wants. But the scriptures are very clear that there are some things that will hinder God being able to answer our prayers. And if we are unaware of that and we deal, don't deal with that, then we're going to find ourselves constantly doubting God's existence or constantly doubting that God hears us, constantly doubting that God even cares for us because he's unable to communicate with us the way he's desiring to do that. The Bible describes a number of reasons why God might be silent. And the number one reason that I believe our prayers may not be answered is because of unconfessed sin. That's your first word on your sermon notes if you're filling them in. Sin unconfe or unconfessed sin. Isaiah 59 verse 2 makes this statement. It says, it's your sins that have cut you off from God because of your sins. He has turned away and he will not listen anymore. It's because of our sins that God is unwilling to listen or is not able to listen. One of the primary reasons that God may not be answering our prayers is because we're hanging on to unconfessed sin or unrepentant hearts, hardened hearts. Sin cuts us off from God. It's like a wall that goes up instantly. It's what Adam and Eve had the problem with in the garden. At the moment sin entered into their lives, at the moment they disobeyed God, the breakdown of relationship, the wall between them and God, the relationship of Knowing God like they did was gone instantly. And that's what it does for you and I. James 4.17, good verse to memorize if you haven't already. It simply says this, it is sin to know what you ought to do and you don't do it. It's a sin or it's sin to know the th good things that you should be doing and you don't do it. 
If sin separates us from God, which it does, and we are doing the things that we, are, we know are wrong according to his word and according to his will, then there is a fairly good chance that we are going to be hindering the process God has to be able to answer our prayers. If we know there is unconfessed sin in our life, that's a problem. Unless, of course, we do what I talked about before, humble ourselves and we admit our wrong and we seek his forgiveness. James says to know the good that we ought to do and refuse to do it sets us up for a time of silence from God. Because sin has caused God to turn away from us and he, he won't listen. That's why we need to take sin seriously. That's why we need to be obedient to the word of God. We need to know the word of God. We can't expect that we can to, to cast aside God's word in our society or in our life and expect to God to continue to go on blessing us. As a nation, we cannot expect to throw out our, our Christian heritage, to throw out the word of God, the principles of scripture from our laws of government and from our society in general and expect that God will continue to bless our nation as he has in the past. Whenever God's people turned away from him, their, their prayers went unheeded. Read it in scripture. Read it through. Any time people were disobedient, God did not fulfill his promises at that time. Time and time again. It wasn't usually that he went silent straight away because he usually, in the Old Testament at least, spoke through prophets, warning them time and time and time again. But the people didn't want to hear God. They didn't want to hear what he had to say to them. He, they didn't want to change. And so then we had 400 years of silence from God between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But had God forgotten them? Not in a moment had he forgotten them. But he gave them 400 years to wake up to themselves and ask the question, why is God so silent? Why don't we hear from God anymore? Why is he not doing things anymore? Why is he acting like he's acting? Why does he not do those things of old? And then suddenly, out of the blue, or so they think, comes the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the greatest miracle of all, kind, all time. And you know what? The world missed it. They missed it completely. All the people that should have known about the coming Messiah, all the people that knew the scriptures of old, all the prophecies that had been given about Jesus Christ or about the Messiah, all were known by the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the time and every one of them missed it. And Jesus' birth was recorded by shepherds. They were recorded by people who did not really have the proper understanding, but God spoke to them because he wanted them to hear and they were the ones that heard, had ears to listen. If our prayers are not being answered or it seems that God's not listening to us, unconfessed sin may well be the cause of that. What can we do about it? Well, Luke tells the people in Acts chapter 3, he says, repent of your sins and turn to God. Repent. So that your sins might be wiped away, he says. And John adds in 1 John, he says, but if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and he's just and he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. If we confess and we repent and we turn back to God, our sins can be wiped away. And the, the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father can be restored. 
So if there's nothing else from today that you take home or you, you dwell upon, it's this. Is there anything in your life that has not been confessed or you are holding on to unconfessed unforgiveness in your heart? Today is the day of salvation for you. Today is the day of restitution. Today is the day of reconnection with God. Today is the day that you can hear God speak again. And today we celebrate David, King David, perhaps one of the greatest kings Israel's ever had, understood this when he wrote in Psalm 66. He says, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen and he paid attention to my prayer. Because if you read Psalm 51, you'll discover a whole psalm of David's repentance. He even wrote it down for us. So repentance and confession are a great way. In fact, I would even go further. They're the only way that we are going to be able to rid sin from our life and have the communication path to God restored that we once enjoyed or we perhaps never enjoyed. Secondly, unforgiving and unforgiving spirit. Forgiveness is the way to a happy relationship. There's no question about that. If if we're unwilling to forgive, the relationship's going to be distorted and broken and hard work. Lack of trust, all of those things. But forgiveness is the path to restoring a strong and happy relationship. The unwillingness to forgive always results in a divided relationship. All of you can testify to that. I'm absolutely confident of that. You don't need to be told that. When we possess an unforgiving spirit, we hinder God also from being able to answer our prayers. And the longer that we hold on to this unforgiveness, the more distance that we put between God and ourselves, the more distant the relationship becomes. In fact, having an unforgiving spirit prevents God from able to, being able to forgive our sin. So even if we do confess sin that we spoke about and we're just holding on to this unforgiveness in other areas of our life, Listen to this, Mark 11 says, but when you're praying, first, number one, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against, forgiveness against other people, so that you can feel good, or so that you get a reward from them, or so that they let you back into their house, Uh uh-uh, so that our Heavenly Father will forgive us as well. If you have an unforgiving spirit and you're holding on to a grudge with somebody else, the forgiveness that God wants to extend to your asking him to forgive your sins is not able to happen. First, we're told, go and forgive those who have wronged you. And there are many other things that can introduce an unforgiving spirit into our life. We can, we can have hard-hearted, but two of the two main ones, without going into any depth here, but you need to study it or, or look at it for yourself, two of the main reasons are past hurts and, and disappointments is number one. If they're left to fester, past hurts and disappointments are left to fester into your life, it will eat at you and gradually become this bitter giant in your heart. And unless we release those past hurts and disappointments that are going to result in us having a hard heart, an unforgiving spirit that will hinder the ability that God has to forgive us as well. Secondly, people who have wronged us can create in us an unforgiving spirit. And if we have not forgiven them or we will not forgive them, they will control your life by default. If you are hanging on to an unforgiving or having an unforgiving spirit with with unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody, they are controlling you. Even if you don't want them to, they are. 
If someone has hurt you, do not spend the next 10 years or more, perhaps, of your life hurting yourself by hanging on to that offence. It's possible. It's possible that if you... You may be doing that, but it's possible that the other person isn't even thinking about you. That they've gone on from that and not given that whole time another thought. And yet it's controlling how you feel. It's controlling how you live. It's by default affecting you. The only one hurt in that situation is you and I, if we hang on to this unforgiving spirit. And the harsh reality is that most people do have a hard time forgiving someone who has hurt them deeply. That's just the way it is. The deeper the hurt, the harder it is to forgive. And as Christians, though, the scriptures tell us that we are to forgive others because we've been forgiven. And as Christ followers, I want us to realise that we have an obligation to forgive, not because they deserve it. And they may not even be right. But we have an obligation to forgive that person or people because God has forgiven us a much greater debt. If God has not forgiven us, all eternity is lost to us. We have disobeyed him, we have ignored him, we do not obey his word. Even by lacking or un being unwilling to forgive is being disobedient to his word. And we need to realise that we have an obligation just to be obedient to him to forgive that person. It doesn't mean that we, we trust them implicitly straight away or ever perhaps. It doesn't mean that we agree with what they've done. It doesn't mean that they were right in what they've done. It's a matter of releasing them and saying, Lord, I, I forgive them. And if you're able to talk to them to do that, but I forgive them so that my spirit can be released. And this unforgiveness that I've been hanging on to can no longer prevent the relationship that I want to have with my heavenly father. 2 Timothy 3 says this, that in the, Paul, Paul tells us in, in Timothy that in the last days it will be self-centered kind of stuff. He says there will be, they will be unloving, unforgiving, they will slander others and they'll have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. That's the world we live in. Did you notice the word unforgiving in there as well? So if we are unwilling to forgive our brother who has hurt us and wronged us, how can we expect God to forgive us when we've hurt and wronged him so much more? There are so many parables in the New Testament and so many examples in the Old and know this, that an unforgiving spirit is the spirit that needs to be dealt with. It is a spirit. So seek the Lord. Ask him to show you the steps that need to happen for you to be released from this unforgiving spirit in your life. And thirdly and finally, an unbelieving heart. Doubt is the opposite to faith. If we have faith in God, our actions ought to reflect our faith in God. But when we doubt, or if we have doubts, the scriptures tell us that we should not expect to receive anything from God. James 1, when you ask him, that is God, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Do not doubt, because we shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord if our mind is doubting God's 
ability or his existence or his presence. James goes on to say that if we doubt, it means that our loyalty is divided. We'll have one foot in the world camp and one foot in the God camp and expect that we're going to get the full blessings of God in the process. Our loyalty being divided between God and the world. And when that happens, we should not expect God to even do anything in the way of listening. Why would we expect that? If we know that our loyalty is divided, or we, we say with one, I was going to say hand, but we don't speak with our hand, or some do. But on one hand, we, we say that we have faith in God, and on the other hand, we, we say that we, we don't trust God for this. Do we really have faith in God to be God? So the question then is, are we divided? And yes, we are. If when you doubt, you shouldn't expect anything from God, we read in James. If God is silent, perhaps the lesson that he wants us to learn is to simply have faith. Strengthen our faith. Believe him for the big things. Believe him for the little things. Just learn to have faith that he will come through. Faith in him, faith in his ability, faith in him to do what he says. And it's not just for those who are strong in their faith that will get answers. I, I mentioned James before where it says we, if we know the good we ought to do and we don't do it, that's sin. If we claim to have faith in God and we don't trust him, the question needs to be asked, do we really know God? If we claim to believe in God, to have faith in God, and we don't trust him, do we really believe in him? We'd like to. Is he really our God? Is he really our Lord? Is he Lord of our life? Has he really made a difference in our life if we, we can say it with our mouth, but our actions are totally opposite? An unbelieving heart turns us away from God and directly towards the things of this world. And having a heart of unbelief results in us being so disobedient. Having a, a faithless faith, if you want to put it that, that way, insults a living, faithful, almighty God. If we don't believe him in his works and his ways, we insult him. And so why should we expect anything from God if that's the case? Hebrews 3 says this, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving turning you away from the living God. And there are going to be things in our life that are going to test our faith from time to time. Being sifted is that process. The 12 spies that entered into the promised land all had the same experience, all saw the same things. 10 of them, though, measured their ability to overcome those hurdles by their own ability, their own strength. Two of them, Caleb and Joshua, measured their ability to overcome by God's ability. Ten of them put their faith in themselves. Two of them put their faith in God. What happened? Ten of them convinced an entire nation to doubt God. So an entire nation failed to receive the blessing of being in the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb were allowed into the promised land. Why? Because they were faithful. Because of their faith in God's ability to do what he can do. If you read that part of scripture, you'll discover that Joshua or Caleb speaks up. He says, we can't. They're big. They're monstrous. 
They're far bigger than us, but our God can. He's brought us safe thus far. He's opened up the oceans. He's opened up the hills for water. He's provided for a way for us. He can do that. But the power of 10 was too great. Having faith in God is key to experiencing God and hearing his voice. And if God is silent, maybe he's trying to show you that he is faithful. And he's, he's sifting things out of your life at this moment in time to try to show you just how faithful he is. And he's sifting things out so that we can learn to trust him more so that our faith can be strengthened. Sifting might sound like a painful experience, and it can be, and it will be. No one wants to have pain and suffering. We talked about that last week. But when our faith is in God, it's also in him to do what is best and what is right, even though we don't understand the outcome. If we trust God, we can look around our world and say, Lord, I have no idea why this world is just where it's going to head. What's going to happen? What's going to be the outcome of all of this stuff? When is this stuff going to finish so that we can get back to some sort of life that we like? We have no answers to those questions. But if our faith is in God, it doesn't matter because he is able to do immeasurably more than what we could ever ask for or imagine. He's able to do anything and he will do everything that's necessary to bring his people into his presence, to sift us out to, or to sift out those things that are wrong, to bring us into his presence. He will do what's right and best to turn us back toward him. And it's my prayer that this series that we've been through or going through has been and will be an encouragement for a very long time. All of us struggle. And I believe the last 12 months have been perhaps some of the most difficult days or difficult times that I have ever experienced in ministry. I, I've, I've, it's been tough as a pastor. I want to tell you that, a transparent day today. But to lead with confidence and courage when at times those things were so unclear and still are. Constantly being asked, how long is this going to go for? Why do we have to do this? I want to sit here. Why can't I sit there? There, All of those things have just been not individually hard, but it's been stressful and hard at times as a pastor and leaders of our church. The board has gone through that with us. And I shared with you a couple of weeks ago about when I was preparing this series the one on shaking, particularly. At that time, our, our state government, our premier, brought into law that we all had to wear masks over Easter. Remember that? I was fuming mad. It was ridiculous. Does she even know how big Queensland is? Does she even know how far from Brisbane we are? That were my thoughts. And I was cranky and I was trying to prepare a series on being sifted and I was missing the point. I was furious at our Premier. I was furious at the masks and every conversation that I had for about three days focused on that. It was much the same as at the beginning of COVID when we first hit with that. I remember standing here one Sunday morning the week before we were shut down saying, and knowing that COVID was there and there was things starting to take place as far as restrictions coming into place. And I stood here before you and I said to you, you know what, even if we have to go outside and we've got to stay outside doors, we're not going to shut this church down. You know what? I think it was Tuesday, two days later, we got told that we couldn't even meet outside. We couldn't leave our homes. We had to shut down the churches and suddenly I'm thinking, well, that's ridiculous. How did we do that? And, and, our, and so much pressure then came on. We've got to get a message to our people. How do we do church from this point on? 
And within a period of three days, we had to get equipment, we had to do recordings, we had to upload stuff. And I don't know whether most of you know this, but that very first service that we recorded, pre-recorded, so that you could have on March the 29th of 2020, it was the first fully online service that we did. Jonathan spent until about 3.30 on Sunday morning getting that video rendered and ready so that you could watch it at 10. It was hard work and we, I remember saying at that time, we cannot go on like this. We, this is unsustainable. We can't be sitting up till all hours of the morning being good stewards so that we can do that. And while on the outside I tried not to show it, and I think I did a relatively good job of that, but the, it, I was frustrated and I was discouraged when the church got shut down. But bit by bit, I remember Jonathan saying, well, next time, Dad, I think I can actually do it a little bit differently. We can actually do some stuff. One of the problems was we had so little time and we were still recording on Saturday afternoon. And on one week, I said that we'll meet regardless. I was shut down. I was, it was a awakening call for me. And our online service became our main service. And I was frustrated and needed to pre-record. I was frustrated that we had to work in advance so far. I, as much as I loved doing it, I was taking video files to people. But it was frustrating that we had to. But it was not too long before God woke me up. And in fact, this statement came to me. Someone actually made this statement. I think it was Pastor Don at the time, but I've said it to you so many times. When our foundations are shaken, doors fly open. And that's what happened. Our foundations were shaken and doors of opportunity opened up. And today we have more people watching online than we've ever had previous to COVID. We've got more opportunities of doing things, of seeing people come to know the Lord even every, almost, I won't say every week, regularly there are people who are in person or online watching who, are, who have made that step of growth, who have given their heart to the Lord, who have sought after prayer, who have communicated the Lord's love with each other better than we could have. The foundations were shaken, doors of opportunity flew open. And while God may have been seemingly silent in those times, there was anything but silence. It was, it was our unwillingness to listen at times. And we cannot afford to dwell on the past or dwell on the negative or dwell on what we can't do. We need to start to look at what we can do. We need the, the, I've said this so many times, but the word of God has never been in lockdown the mission of the church has not changed through COVID. By the way, COVID is not the first pandemic this world has encountered. And it may not be the last. And the word of God has prevailed through that all. And it will continue to prevail. You and I are in a, in a critical time in history where we have the responsibility of maintaining and proclaiming the word of God to a nation and a world who is hurt, who is being destroyed, who is being undermined by the, by the self-centeredness and the unwillingness to listen to what God has said, unwillingness to repent, unwillingness to look for forgiveness for their sin, unwillingness to, to get back into God's presence. And while ever that's maintained, you and I have a big job on our hand and we need each other. We need one another more than we've ever needed each other before. And I want to encourage you. This is a wonderful time to be alive. Frustrating, yes, but wonderful nevertheless. Do you think that the disciples at the crucifixion were rejoicing that Jesus was on the cross? No, absolutely not. They'd all run away, most of them. But do you know that within just days, they were rejoicing because their eyes had been opened and their ears had been opened. And that's what God has done in my life. I want it and I believe he's done it in your life. That even though our foundations are shaken, the doors are wide open now for the gospel to go. The message of hope to get into our world.
So embrace the opportunity. Be ready to step up and do whatever he calls you to do. Don't, now is not the time to pull back. Now is not the time to, to relinquish responsibility. But it's a time for us Christians to stand up and accept responsibility for the job that we have in this world and in this community. Now more than ever before, we need to be shining like the stars in this dark world. Now like more than ever, we need to be proclaiming Jesus Christ. He's the hope of the nation. The local church is the place where God's love and forgiveness and everything else can abound. So we have to be the church. Not enclosed in four walls. Not about the building. Yes, I love the idea that we're doing some building process, but that's not the church. You and I make up the church. And I encourage you over the, over the coming days and over the coming weeks to take hold of what God has taught you, to take hold of what God is teaching you, to allow the sifting to take place in your life so that when God shakes or when he selects you out of a bunch of others or when he starts to put you through the times of suffering or when he is completely silent, that you'll wake up and you'll turn your heads and hearts back to the Lord Jesus Christ and will not be doubting his word, but our faith will increase and we will begin to see the power of God at work in this place, in our community, and I believe in our nation. Let's pray for our leaders. You are a wonderful group of people. I thank God daily for you because I know that you are the hope of our nation. You have the message of hope. And whether you're 2, 20 or 200, and you're breathing, God has a purpose for your life and a reason for you being here. May God bless you. May his face shine upon you. May peace come into your life. May you be a blessing to those that you come into contact with and shine the light of Jesus in your world. May God bless you. Amen. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the wonderful way in which you work. I thank you that you care for us, that you love us, that you want us to be part of your presence. And even though, Lord, today perhaps we complain about a lot of stuff, even the length of sermons at times, but I pray that we might acknowledge you. That we won't hinder the work that you want to do in our life because of our hard-heartedness or unwillingness to submit to you. And Lord, if you're silent, help us not to just whine and whinge about that, but to examine our hearts. To ask ourselves the tough questions. To seek after you with all of our heart. Because, Lord, I'm confident that if, if you seem far away from us, it's not you that's moved. And so I do pray for this church. I pray for those who are watching behind a, a device or a screen somewhere else on this planet. I pray for those who would watch this or be part of this into the future. And I know, Lord, that your heart is to bless your people. Your desire is that we might have everything that we, we need and more. And you've given us those things, Father. Help us to be faithful, to see the glory of God, to not have our eyes blinded, but to see your glory in everything, in all places. And I pray now, Father, this, this building might be filled with your presence wherever we're watching online, that the rooms will be filled with your presence and that we will experience the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in a very real, tangible way. I commit this group to you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.